but um, this is what I have now. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Codina. Ramon Codina is Professor of Continuum Mechanics and uh, Structural Analysis at EPC in Barcelona. Uh, Ramon is an expert in uh, finite elements applied to several engineering uh, uh, problems uh, with a focus on uh, fluid mechanics, uh, solids, and uh, electromagnetism. Uh, Professor Codina leads the numerical analysis uh, and uh, computation group uh, recognized for uh, excellence by the Gen uh, Generalitat de Catalunya and heads the fluid mechanics group at uh, CIM. Among uh, the several uh, achievements, uh, we can cite the Prandtl Medal from ECOMAS 2018 and the multiple ICREA Academia Awards from the Catalonian government. So I leave you the floor. It's a very pleasure to have uh, here you. And uh, the title is Mixed Finite Elements Method in Elasticity in Suit Stability versus Stabilization. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Simona, for the introduction. And of course, thank you very much for the invitation. It is a pleasure, a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so um, when Simone invited me to give a talk here, um, I decided not to talk about, uh, let's say, hot topics in the sense that uh, we, we, most of us work in, in some, let's say, uh, topics that are nowadays a fashion, such as artificial intelligence, neural networks, and model order reduction, data driven science, whatever. We also do that. So we cannot escape the main the main trend, <clears throat> but I decided to talk about something very classic. Okay, something going back to the uh, core of solving uh, PDEs and solving uh, PDEs of mixed form. Uh, I had another talk, a similar one in which I compared different <clears throat> uh, mixed problem mixed problems, Maxwell's, Lassie's, uh, Stokes. Here, what I did is uh, to, uh, what I decided is to talk about uh, the, the common line is elasticity. Okay, so the common line is to uh, talk about different problems that we may encounter in elasticity. <clears throat> Sorry for my voice. I, I started to feel sick yesterday. So yesterday morning I was uh, perfectly fine, but uh, now I have this. Uh, this is not my voice. Uh, that's what I mean. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk. <clears throat> I, I will make a brief introduction, and then I will talk about uh, three uh, mixed formulations in elasticity. One is the stress displacement pressure formulation, in which uh, we have three unknowns living in three different uh, functional spaces. Then I will talk about the stress displacement formulation, which has a, a key property, and it's that it uh, admits uh, two functional settings, the primal one and the dual one. <clears throat> in this particular case, in the case of the stress displacement formulation, I want to um, uh, highlight a property that for us has been very important in, uh, in time, which is this uh, improved stress convergence. Um, as uh, I will try to explain in solid mechanics, this has been really crucial for us. And then I will talk very briefly about the displacement pressure formulation, just, just Stokes problem. So this is not, nothing new there in the case of, of the Stokes problem. And then I will <clears throat> make a few comments about uh, what would happen if you want to extend these formulations to uh, finite strain hyperelasticity. And finally, I will conclude. So for the introduction, the boundary value problem that we want to solve is in the most general case, uh, this one. So the, the linear elasticity problem. <clears throat> so here, sigma is the deviatoric part of the, the, devi the deviatoric part of the, uh, stress, P is the pressure. I use the convention of fluid mechanics because usually in solid mechanics, people call the pressure as um, the trace of sigma, and then you have a minus sign here, but I prefer to use <coughs> P positive in compression because that's what I am used to. Uh, but anyway, you can you can choose both options. So uh, as I said, a sigma is the deviatoric part of the stress. P is the trace of the stress. Um, U is the displacement. Uh, epsilon is the linear strain, which is the symmetric, yeah, the symmetric gradient of the of the displacement, and then you have the constitutive law <coughs> that relates uh, that relates the deviatoric part of the strain of the stress to the strain, and in this case it's just uh, the classical linear elasticity equation. So here we have uh, almost all possible variables you may you may be interested in. So the deviatoric stress, the pressure, displacement, and, and strain. In the case in which we introduce the pressure, 
if we introduce the pressure, it is usually because we are interested in the limit when the bulk modulus kappa tends to infinity, so the inverse tends to zero, so that's the so-called incompressible. So in cases in which we deal with pressure, it's because uh, a kappa minus one is, is zero. Otherwise, if kappa is, is bounded, you can just express P in terms of the divergence of U and, and substitute it there and end up with an equation post in terms of, of the stress and the displacement of. Okay. <clears throat> um, so uh, there are several formulations that you can, you can uh, obtain from this very general case. So you can, for instance, what I will do in this talk is to consider the case in which sigma p and u are unknowns, but not epsilon, not, epsilon, not the strain, although it could, uh, it could also be taken into account. Then a second case I will consider is the case in which, uh, in which um, the strain is expressed in terms of a displacement, and also the pressure is expressed in terms of the divergence of u, so that kappa is not infinity. So <clears throat> this is the so-called uh, stress displacement computation. And finally, the last uh, case is the one that you have when you express sigma in, ter in terms of epsilon, the strain, and the strain in, ter in terms of the displacement, but you still keep the pressure, which is the displacement pressure formulation, which in the case of uh, incompressible materials is exactly the Stokes problem. So I will uh, consider all all these cases. What I will not consider <clears throat> is the, the case in which uh, you eliminate all variables but the displacement, which is the so-called irreducible, irreducible formulations. Okay, that that is, that is what I will not consider. I will not consider either cases in which the strains are in the, are independent variables, but it's very easy to take them uh, to consider also strains as independent variables. So we have, I will talk about three mixed formulations that all require the upper frequency condition for, for the problem to be, for the problem to be well posed. And of course, if you uh, use the Golurkin finite element approximation, you have to make sure that the discrete spaces inherit these in subconditions. Sometimes it is easy, sometimes it's not that easy. My point of view is that this is not by no means a general approach. And if you want to be really general, the only possibility is to use a stabilization. That's the message I, I, I want to transmit. And, uh, of course, if you don't want to satisfy the if condition, the alternative is to use a stabilized finite line method. And the main objective of, of this talk is uh, to present the stabilized uh, formulation in which we work, which is uh, framed in the so-called variational multiscale uh, concept, uh, in this case for mixed problems. You know, stabilization is mainly needed for, uh, mainly needed for two uh, big purposes. <clears throat> One is the compatibility, to circumvent the compatibility between the interpolating spaces. In this case, in our case, uh, stress, uh, displacement, and pressure. So uh, the main, one of the main um, uh, uses of stabilized formulations is uh, to avoid the insub conditions. And then there is another use that, of course, I will not talk about that uh, here, which is to, to deal with uh, singularly perturbed problems, such as convection diffusion with dominant convection, or diffusion reaction with dominant reaction, or plates with very thin uh, thickness. So those are singularly perturbed problems that can be, you know, can be also dealt with using a stabilization, but I will not talk about it. So let's start with the, uh, these, uh, with the velocity or excuse me, displacement, stress, uh, pressure formulation. <clears throat> uh, as you see, what I will, this section is based on a paper that was published three years ago almost. Uh, but as I said, this, this is uh, uh, basic uh, tools to solve PDEs and not, uh, and not um, let's say, the current uh, uh, trend in, in research. So let's consider the three field approach in which the variables, the unknowns are the velocity, stress, uh, displacement, stress, and pressure. So the, the problem can be written as, as, uh, as indicated here in equation one, where the bilinear form of the problem has uh, three contributions. In red, we have the contribution from the, let's say, momentum equation, the conservation of linear momentum. So the red terms equal to the right hand side are nothing but the, <coughs> but the momentum equation. As you see, the stress, uh, the divergence of the stress has been integrated by parts. So you have 
here the symmetric gradient of the test function. So in blue, we have the contribution from the continuity equation. Recall that when we, deal, when we consider the pressure, it's because the uh, material is incompressible. So this is uh, uh, the, the blue term arises from the continuity equation. And then the green term comes from the constitutive equation that relates the deviatoric stress to the strain. Okay? And it's written in a way that makes the problem symmetric. Okay, so this is the three field formulation of the of the problem, of the elasticity problem. If now you do finite elements, in particular if you do the Colorkin method, <coughs> what you have to solve is this, this discrete variational uh, problem in which UH stands for the type of, that has displacements, pressure, and stress, and VH is the corresponding uh, triplet for the test functions. Uh, it is immediately checked that the, this bilinear form is not coercive. If, uh, if you take uh, the test functions equal to the unknown, so V equals U, Q equals P, and tau equals sigma, you see that this term cancels with this one, and this term cancels with the first one. So you are left with one over two mu sigma tau, and if tau is equal to sigma, you have a nice control on the L2 norm of the stress, but nothing else, okay? So you perfectly control the L2 norm of the stress, but you don't control anything else. And of course, the Galerkin method is not stable. So you don't have control neither on the, what, what would you need? You, need? you would need to have control on the gradients of the displacements because the displacements live in H1, and you would, have, uh, you would need to have control on the pressure, on the L2 norm of the pressure. And, and you don't have it. You simply don't have it. So how can you obtain that? How can you obtain that control? Well, as, as usual, the problem is well posed. If the general subcondition uh, holds for the for the abstract problem, and in this particular case, it can be shown that this bilinear form B is in superstable if these two uh, in subconditions hold between the pressure space and the displacement space, and the displacement space and the stress space. So these are sometimes called the little subconditions. I, I like this name, little new subconditions in contrast to the global one. Okay, if these two in subconditions hold, hold, it can be shown that the global one also holds. It's not trivial though, but it can be it can be shown. What is trivial is to see that if these two conditions hold, then the problem is stable. So you have a bound for the pressure and a bound for the gradient of the displacement. And since the problem is well posed and, and the if subcondition is a necessary and sufficient condition for well posedness, then you can, uh, you can uh, conclude that the if subcondition holds. But if you want to find the uh, global in subconstant from the uh, little in subconstants, it, it takes a while uh, to prove that, but it can be. So the problem is that these two in subconditions uh, pose very stringent requirements on the choice of the finite element spaces. This is very difficult to satisfy at the same time, particularly if you want to use continuous stresses, which is necessary in some cases. For instance, in viscoelasticity, you're interested in using continuous stresses, and if the stress uh, is continuous, it's very difficult to satisfy these conditions. There are few elements that are known to satisfy that, and one of the examples is the old uh, Marshall crochet element, which is uh, this one depicted. So what is the Marshall crochet element? It's an element in which uh, the displacement is uh, interpolated through biquadratic functions. So this is uh, a quadratic in each uh, component. It's a plot, of course. Uh, pressures are piecewise linear and discontinuous. That's why I have... Uh, uh, plotted the uh, pressure to this inferior in the inferior of the elements. But now it is, uh, <clears throat> say, uh, difficult to foresee at the beginning is which is the correct interpolation for the stress that satisfies the if subcondition if you want the stress to be continuous. If the stress is discontinuous, it's very easy. But if you want the stress to be continuous, it's easy. Here it turns out that. Uh, 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 you can obtain a stable formulation if you interpolate the stresses on a patch of four times four bilinear elements. Okay, so the resulting space for uh, uh, stress, uh, displacement, and pressure 
happens to, sat to satisfy the, the literal in subconditions, and from them, you can conclude that the global in subcondition falls. But it's not easy. So what we want is something much simpler from the, from the implementation point of view, which is the objective of what I will present, which is uh, to use or to present a stabilized finite element method that can deal with any interpolation. But in particular, <clears throat> in particular, uh, you can be interested in using equal interpolation of all the unknown. So that means that you can use um, for the stresses, the displacements and the pressures by quadratic for all of them, or linear for all of them, or whatever for all of them, or different from all of them. In fact, um, the formulation I will present works for any interpolation of a stress, displacement, and friction. So <clears throat> these are the formulations we work uh, we work with uh, are based on the VMS concept, variational multi scales concept, which was introduced in in um, almost uh, almost uh, thirty years ago already <laughs> uh, um, by by Hughes. But it's it's in fact it's a, a very general concept that you can find also in other cases, not only in in, in the numerical approximation of uh, PMS. So the idea <clears throat> is to split the unknown into the component that can be approximated in the finite element space, whatever it is, plus something else. And the idea is to, to end up with an expression from this something else, this uh, additional term that I will call subgrid scale. Okay. And that, that of course, induces a, a, a splitting of uh, the space, um, of the finite element space, and the space uh, that complements uh, X in the, in the continuous space, which is called here. X prime, and as I said before, is going to be called the space of subgrid scales. Okay. So the original problem, problem one, the one I wrote at the very beginning, is exactly equivalent for these two equations. This is easily checked because uh, since we are dealing with a linear problem, then uh, uh plus u prime is u, uh h plus u prime is, is u, and the first equation is tested with uh, functions in uh, in x uh, h, the finite element space. And the second equation is obtained uh, by testing with functions in the complement, whatever it is. Okay, so this is what is uh, written here. So x, the continuous space, is the finite element of space plus something else, and that induces the decomposition of the unknowns and the test functions. So <clears throat> now, now the point is, well, what is the idea? The idea is um, from this equation in green obtain a sort of approximation to u prime, because this is the equation projected onto uh, x prime. So from this equation, try to obtain an expression of u prime in terms of uh, in terms of uh, and then plug it back to the first equation so that at the end, you get a modification of the uh, Golurkin method. So you would have the Golurkin term plus something else that hopefully will act as a stabilization. Okay. Now, the first point is that <clears throat> we will try to get approximations for the unknowns u prime, but not for their derivatives. Okay, so this is the first point to keep in mind. So we will try to get an approximation, for, but not for the derivatives of u prime. So that means that in the, in, in the terms that involve derivatives of the unknown in this expression, we essentially will integrate by parts. So to avoid computing derivatives of u prime. And if we do that, what we get is uh, this term, uh, the terms written in blue. So the only thing I've done here, or here I haven't done anything. Here I have just a split P as PH plus P prime, sigma as sigma H plus sigma prime. But here, for instance, <coughs> I, I, I would have the divergence of U prime. So instead of having the divergence of U prime, I have integrated by parts and I have the gradient of P multiplied by by u prime. And likewise, in the third equation, in the constitutive equation, sigma is sigma h plus sigma prime. But here, instead of using the symmetric gradient of sigma prime, I integrate by parts and I have u prime divergence of the test function for the stress. So these two equ these equations come simply by isolating the subgrid scales and not using the derivatives of the subgrid scales. Okay, nothing, nothing, everything is exact so far for smooth solutions. We haven't done any approximation. What about the second equation? The second equation means essentially that you are projecting the differential equation you want to solve 
onto the space of subgrid scale. That's essentially what we mean. So up to technicalities on the element boundaries, what you are solving, in fact, is this. You are solving that um, the, the original equations equal to the what I will call the finite element residues, which is if you move uh, all that to the left-hand side, you see that you will have the divergence of sigma prime plus sigma h, the gradient of p prime plus th, and so on. So these are nothing but the original equations. But since they are projected onto <laughs> sigma onto x prime, you may add additional terms such that they are orthogonal and two orthogonal up to technicalities on boundaries, uh, L2 orthogonal to uh, X prime, okay? And in fact, these uh, additional terms, which you still don't know, are responsible to enforce that the uh, solution sigma prime, U prime and P prime belong to the uh, space of subgrade scales that you have chosen, which in fact, I haven't talked about that yet. So everything is exact at this, uh, at this point. Now it comes, you know, once arrived to this point, more or less all uh, variational multiscale formulations look uh, look alike. Uh, now it comes uh, where you have to use your, let's say, inspiration, your intuition, your whatever, uh, to design an approximation for the subgrid scales. You have to approximate that in a sense. Okay, you have to approximate this. Now you can use anything you want. We are designing a method. When you design a method. You can do anything you wish. Once the method is designed, you have to put it in the computer and see that it works, first step. And if it works, you can take a paper and pen and try to prove that it is a stable and convert. Okay? And these methods, the methods that I will show, of course, we have put them uh, uh, in the computer and, and they do work. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about them. And uh, in most cases, we have also proved that they are stable and optimally converging. So what do we do to approximate the subgrid scales? Well, that's our particular option. What we do is <clears throat> to use a Fourier analysis uh, approximation. So what we do is we, we Fourier transform these equations. And now <clears throat> uh, we, we get that. But of course, the Fourier transform is well-defined for functions of rapid decay on the, on the element. This holds for each element of rapid decay on the element. <clears throat> And this, of course, doesn't happen in general. However, you can heuristically justify that if the subgrid scales are dominated by high wave numbers, that's what you expect. I mean, the, uh, intuitively, the subgrid scales uh, are rapidly fluctuating functions. And therefore, if they are dominated by high wave numbers, you can justify that you can really take the Fourier transform and avoid what happens on the boundaries, assuming that it's like a function of rapid decay close to boundaries, okay? And the essence is that if you uh, look at the expression of the Fourier transform, you see that uh, on the boundaries, um, there is a term that decays faster with the wave number than in the interior of the elements, okay? Anyway, uh, this is what, what we say. As I say here, details are, are... Now, once you have this, from this expression, you can solve for sigma, uh, hat, the Fourier transform of the stress, the Fourier transform of the subgrid scale for the pressure, and the Fourier transform of the subgrid scale for the displacement. But that, that of course, gives you a very complex uh, expression. So the idea is that what we will require is not um, is not uh, the values of the of the of the subgrid scales or the Fourier transform of the subgrid scales, but only their norm. So what we do is we impose that the norm is the correct. So the norm of the subgrid scales behaves like uh, the norm of the solution to this expression. Okay, the norm of the solution to this expression. Again, that um, requires some, some heuristic assumptions. Remember that I said that here you are designing a method and you are allowed to do anything. Once the method is designed, it has to work and you have to analyze it. Well, at the end, what uh, turns out is that uh, the subgrid scale can be expressed as a matrix of coefficients of a zero multiplied by the residual. And this residual has three components, the component associated to the momentum equation, to the continuity equation, and to the constitutive equation, okay? So that's the final expression. 
and uh, <clears throat> again, doing additional approximation, approximations can be heuristically argued that alpha zero can be taken as a diagonal matrix. And finally, the final conclusion is that U prime is taken as this parameter that behaves as H square, H being the element size. I will consider it constant. It doesn't, I mean, it's very easy to extend it to, to cases in which uh, H, the mesh size is, and the mesh is not quasi uniform, but let's assume it's uh, quasi uniform. Um, this uh, parameter, this red parameter, where alpha one is, uh, is uh, constant, dimensionless constant, multiplied by the residual of the first equation, um, something similar for the pressures of the scale and for the stress of the scale. Okay, <clears throat> so that's it, that's it. Of course, in the residual, recall that I have included these uh, functions G1, G2, and G3, so the space of the subgroup scales is not defined yet. It's not defined. So what we do is, um, in our particular case, we definitely favor the case in which the subgroup scales are, are taken as L2 orthogonal to the finite element space. For us, it's uh, it's um, it's very very useful, in particular in, uh, particularly in, in fluid mechanics, but also here in solid mechanics. Um, so, in all what I have done, I have assumed uh, essentially continuity of all all variables. Uh, if you wish to deal with uh, discontinuous interpolations, you have to approximate the subgroup scales not only in the element interiors. I didn't mention that explicitly, but it is said here that this holds within each element of the finite element partition. Uh, but I will not talk about that. So there is also the possibility to include, to include uh, the subgroup scales approximated on the element boundaries. Um, and that allows you to use uh, discontinuous interpolations for pressure, stress, uh, or stress. If, if okay, uh, so finally, <clears throat> which, which is the expression for the subgroup scales? If you choose the subgroup scales to be orthogonal to the finite element of space, this is the expression of G1, which is the projection of the residual onto, onto the finite element of space. And this is the expression of the subgroup scale. So the subgroup scale is the residual, but not the whole residual, but it's projection orthogonal to the finite element of space. The same for the pressure and the same for the stress. Okay, so this is the final expression of the subgroup scale. And here there are two comments to be made. <clears throat> First, if you take the orthogonal projection, this is gonna be zero because this belongs to the finite element of space of the stresses. So this will cancel out. The, the orthogonal projection of the stress or the finite element of stress will be zero. And that can be also taken as zero because even if uh, F does not belong to the uh, displacement space, its orthogonal component has no effect on the on the solution. Think, for example, of the Golurkin method. In the Golurkin method, you test F with uh, the uh, displacement test function, and what is orthogonal to the finite element uh, displacement uh, the, the displacement finite element space is not the same. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> so just. Um, Accept, let's accept this approximation. It's not crucial, I can still keep it. But if you do that approximation, this is the very final expression for the subgroup scales. So a parameter multiplying the orthogonal projection of certain terms. And now we are done. We are done because if you remember, I said that <clears throat> the idea is that we will obtain the subgroup scales approximated. That's what I have done. This, all these, let's say, tricks have been uh, have as, as, as uh, objective to approximate the subgroup scale from this equation. And once we, once we have this approximation, we just have to plug them uh, in the first equation. If you do that, <clears throat> what you get is this form. This is the final uh, stabilized finite element expression of the group. So in black, you have the Golurkin terms, and in blue, the stabilization terms. Um, it is. Uh, Illustrative to look at the variation of uh, the bilinear form of the problem. So we have the Golurkin form plus something else. And in this something else, in these additional terms in blue, you can see where the additional stability will come from. Why? <clears throat> because we know that from the Golurkin term, when we take V equals U, for instance, we have a stability on the L2 norm of the pressure of the stress. That's what we already have. So this term will be responsible for providing 
L2 stability of the gradient of the displacement. So in a sense, H1 is stability of the displacement, okay? That's what, what this term will be useful for. This term, in fact, can be taken in zero because if you control the whole gradient, you control the divergence. But, uh, and this one, this term, the final term, is what has to be in charge of providing a stability for what? A stability for the pressure, that is what is missing, okay? A stability for the L2 norm. In fact, here we have the L2 norm of the pressure gradient multiplied by H squared, and that can be uh, reversed to L2 control on the pressure. Okay, so th those are the uh, terms that uh, from where stability will be will be obtained. Here, however, let's look at this term, for instance. Here we have the orthogonal projection of the gradient of the displacement. So if you take <clears throat> if you take v equals u, it is clear that that will provide that will uh, yield the L2 norm of the orthogonal projection of the gradient. So what is missing? If you want to control the whole gradient, the whole gradient of the displacement, there is something missing. And what is missing is the projection of the displacement onto the finite point of space. However, the key point when you do the analysis is that the component of the displacement gradient that already belongs to the finite element of space can be controlled by the Golurkin method. Why? Because if we look at the Golurkin equations, the original Golurkin equations, yeah, let's, let's, I mean, this is the continuous case, but it doesn't matter. When, we, when you look at the continuous Golurkin equations, you can take a stress test function in the finite element case, of course, not the gradient of the displacement because that wouldn't belong to the finite element of space, but you can take the projection onto the finite element of space of the gradient of the displacement. Anyway, what I mean is that uh, you really need only to control the orthogonal component because the uh, finite element component of the, the, the gradient of the displacement is already controlled by the Golurkin method. Okay, so um, that's the method. Once we have this method, the work in order for doing the numerical analysis is this one. As you see, we have control on the whole gradient of the displacement multiplied by this algorithmic constant that is of order one. This, which is not really relevant because we also have, we already have control on that. So this is, uh, let's say, uh, um, control on this is a consequence of controlling this. And we have this term, which is not the pressure alone. It has also the divergence but uh, it can be shown that you can control the pressure with this uh, term. So first you have uh, a stability in this norm. You can, you can show that uh, there is a stability in norm and optimal convergence in this norm. So it can, um, as I said, this is a paper from 2009. And in fact, a, a duality argument allows you to obtain a stability not in those, in, in that strange norm, why strange? Sometimes this is called the stabilized norm in the literature. In fact, in this particular case, you can obtain a stability uh, and convergence in the natural norm of the problem, which is, let's say, H1 for displacements, L2 for stresses, and L2 for pressures, okay? And also stability and optimal convergence. Uh, this is a duality argument, but it doesn't use any regularity assumption, so it's dual. I used the duality argument, but not the classical one. The classical duality argument is the ovin nietzsche type duality argument in which you need to use to accept this regularity uh, uh, shift. You know, the, the typical thing that if F is in L2, then displacement, oh, sorry, this is not uh, H2. Uh, it's U in H2, not uh, gradient of U in H2. There is a, a mistake here. So it turns out that if F is in L2, displacements are in H2 and stresses and pressures are in H1. If you accept that, then you can get an L2 estimate for the, for the displacement. Uh, here, in, instead, <clears throat> that duality argument, it was only used to obtain from the, uh, the analysis in the, in the stabilized norm results in the classical. Okay, so this has been the, lo the longest uh, section, the three field uh, formulation, stress, displacement and pressure. Let's move to the stress displacement formulation that is <clears throat> very useful in many, in many situations. Uh, this uh, section is based also on a paper that uh, 
I published together with uh, Santi Badia in 2009, but it's adapted to elasticity. In that paper, we dealt with this C problem. Uh, the results that we show are, are adapted to elasticity. It, essentially, it's, it's very similar. So the questions that we want to solve, now sigma is not the, the diatonic stress, but the total one. So this is the momentum equation, divergence of stress equals F, and the constitutive equation, which is sigma equals C gradient of U. C is the whole constitutive gradient, the fourth order constitutive gradient. <clears throat> but if you want to write the equations in a symmetric form, you have to pre-multiply by C minus one, okay? Now to obtain the uh, weak form of the problem, you have to, uh, take the differential operator of the problem and integrate by parts. Of course, you will obtain the classical weak form of uh, bilinear form of the problem plus boundary terms, plus boundary terms. Another point is that you have two options and those options are very important in elasticity as they are in, in, in the Darcy problem. So, so which are these two options? <clears throat> these two options are, one is to integrate by parts uh, the divergence of the stress so that stresses uh, are only needed in L2. <clears throat> and the second option is not to integrate by parts of divergence of stress, but to integrate by parts of symmetric gradient. And so displacements are only needed in L2. Okay, <clears throat> so these are the so-called primal and dual form of the problem in, in analogy to what is uh, done for the cis problem. You know, you can go from one to the other in different ways, for example, through Legendre transformations or whatever. But the, in essence, what you do is you integrate by parts either one term or the other. So in the primal form, the functional setting is the same as for the three field approach as I was mentioning before. So we have a stresses only in L2. You see that there are no derivatives of the stresses here. <clears throat> and displacements need to be in H1. So we have the symmetric gradient of the stress. However, in the dual form of the problem, uh, you don't integrate the stress, so you have the divergence of the stress, but you do integrate the displacement, the symmetric gradient of the displacement, and therefore uh, displacements need to be only in L2, but then stresses need to be in HD because the divergence has to be uh, a square integrable. Uh, depending on which variational form do you use, the essential boundary conditions are either the displacement in the primal form, for example, you are carrying zero on the boundary, that's what I have used before, or the um, essential boundary conditions can be also the uh, normal components of the stress, also called tractions in the dual form. Here we have this uh, table in which I compare the, the different situations. So this is the space for displacement, the space for stress. So in the primal form, displacements are in H1 and the stress is in L2. And in the dual form, uh, displacements are only in L2 and stresses are in H2. This is the bilinear form of the problem. This is the flux. I mean, the flux is the normal component of this. And this is the directly operator. So when restricted to the boundary, in the first case, boundary conditions are posed on the uh, displacement. And in the second case, boundary com conditions are posed on the normal component of the stress. And then the space of traces on the boundary is also different. In one case is uh, H1 half. So the trace of the displacement is an H1 half function. In the case of the stress is in H minus one half. So <clears throat> the problem again is a mixed problem. And therefore you have a some conditions to satisfy in the discrete problem. When you use the Galerkin approximation, you have to satisfy uh, in subconditions. And the little in subconditions that you need in this case are uh, those written uh, on the slide. So in the case of the primal form, you have this one. This is the subcondition that you need to satisfy to have a well post problem in the primal form. You see that here you have the gradient of the displacement and, and uh, only the stress. Whereas in the dual form, you have uh, this. Uh, so elements that satisfy the first condition are, are simple. Are, for instance, if you take the pressure space, uh, excuse me, the stress space as made of discontinuous functions, this is trivially satisfied just by taking the stresses as gradients of displacement. That's just, that's uh, very, very simple. However, the uh, dual if subcondition is not that easy to satisfy, it's not so easy to satisfy. <clears throat> and, uh, and elements, finite element interpolations that satisfy that 
are essentially extensions of elements that work for the Darcy problem, such as Rabia or Douglas Bertie Marie. Extensions to what? You know, the, the Darcy problem, the, the analogy is the stress would be replaced by the flux, it's a vector, and the displacement would be replaced by pressure, it's a scalar. So we would have, instead of having in the, in the Darcy case, we have the unknowns are a, a vector and a scalar, and in the elasticity equation, the unknowns are a tensor and a vector. But essentially, it's the same. <clears throat> So <clears throat> this is directly the method that, that we propose without uh, introduction. So what happens if you don't want to satisfy the MC condition? So if you don't want to satisfy the MC condition, you can use this stabilized bilinear form. This is the, the bilinear form from the Golurkin method. And to that, you have to add stabilization terms. So the conclusion, the bottom line is that the stabilization terms will back down. So to stabilize uh, the stress, you have to add divergence of the stress, orthogonal component of the divergence of the stress. So this is a stress test function multiplied by a certain parameter and the same and something similar for the displacement. And if you are interested in using discontinuous interpolations for stresses and displacements, you have to add these two terms. And now here the point I would like to stress, of course, I, I, I uh, detail uh, anything here, but the, the only thing I would like to stress is here is that you have a parameter here that is L, that is a length scale. And to me, it was very satisfying to see that I could switch from one functional setting, the primal one, to the dual one, just by changing the definition of this length scale L. It turns out that if you take L as the element size, you are reproducing the primal setting the primal functional setting. Whereas if you take L as a characteristic length scale of the, of the domain, let's say one arising from Poincare's inequality or from Cohn's inequality, and, and a length scale of the domain, then you are reproducing the dual set. And that can be already seen from, from, from these terms. What happens if um, L is uh, H? If L is H, Essentially, you don't have control on the divergence of the stress because you will, of course, you will have that, but that will, multi that will, be, will be multiplied by h square, and when h goes to zero, this control will be negligible. However, if L is a fixed length scale, that will provide control on the divergence of the stress. That is what you need for the dual formulation of the elasticity equation. And likewise, for this term, what happens if L is square T, L, L is H? If L is H, then this term will be of order one, and therefore, you will have control on the gradient of the displacement. And that's what you need for the primal set. For the primal uh, formulation of the problem, the displacements need to be in H1. Whereas if L is a characteristic length, uh, when h goes to zero, this term will not provide the stability. And the stability it provides will be negligible. And as I said, I, I will not mention that, but this is needed. These two terms are needed in case you you want to deal with uh, with uh, uh, discontinuous interpolations. So here is uh, a table that is a bit uh, loaded, <clears throat> but uh, let me explain. So. You can, this is a summary of error estimates that we were able to prove in the RC problem and later extend to the elasticity equation. So essentially, you can take L equal to H or to L0. Okay? In one case, you are reproducing the primal form and the other the dual form. So K is the order of interpolation of the stress and U is the order, um, excuse me, and L is the interpolation of the, the interpolation order of the space. For instance, in the primal formulation, the optimal uh, combination, I mean, if you don't satisfy that, nothing happens, but you're losing something. So the optimal combination is to have displacements of one order more than the stresses, okay? In the primal formulation. Whereas in the dual formulation, the stresses are one order more than displacements. In, for example, of the rabiato mai element. In the rabiato mai element, the simplest case has linear stresses, not complete, by the way, but linear stresses and only piecewise constant displacements. Okay? Uh, whereas for the primal formulation, 
you if you have uh, elements of degree L in the displacement, you can uh, have one degree less for the stress at the time of formulation. But the important thing is that there is an intermediate case, which is not either, neither the primal nor the dual form, which can be uh, obtained by choosing this length scale as an, uh, let's say, a geometric average of this one and this. This was, uh, this was nice. And this uh, option, I will not uh, go into details, but happens to be better than either this one or this one, and optimal when equal interpolation is chosen. Anyway, I, I, that was, um, let's say, uh, a, a result that we found uh, very interesting. So let me talk about um, a crucial uh, uh, point about the 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 stress displacement form the stress displacement formulation in our group has been exploited a lot because it is very 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 useful in particular in nonlinear solid mechanics. What I have explained is also in linear uh, is only in linear elasticity. But there is an important remark that um, is the motivation for extending that to nonlinear solid mechanics, as I said, in our group has been exploited a lot, not only by, by, by me and my direct uh, co colleagues, but also uh, by other people in, in our department. Let's talk about the, this um, improved stress convergence that you get in the sigma stress population. <clears throat> so let's, let's consider the irreversible I haven't been talking about that, but this is the reversible form of the problem, which only displacements uh, appear as unknowns. You know that if you have a corner, uh, we may assume that the solution you are a reentrant corner, so it's uh, a non convex domain with a reentrant corner. You know that it is known that the solution belongs to one, uh, H1 plus S, with S being between zero and one. In fact, in most cases, it's between one half and one. But anyway, it is smaller than one if you have a reentrant corner. The best uh, convergence estimate you could obtain would be this one because uh, u is only in H1 plus S. So that is the best you could obtain. I'm not saying that uh, this is easy to obtain. I'm just saying that if you obtain something, this is the best you will obtain. Nothing better than that because this is the maximum regularity of u. Okay. And this is true regardless of the polynomial order of the interpolation. So it doesn't matter whether you use linear elements or elements of the 24. I mean, it doesn't really matter because this is the maximum regularity you have when you have a reentrant point. And if this happens for the displacement, what happens for the stress? For the stress, you have one order less. So the stresses converge only with order h to the power of s in L2. I'm not saying you will be able to find that. I'm just saying that that is the best you can hope. Okay, stresses will be of order h. But now, in many uh, constitutive laws in solid mechanics, you need not the L2 convergence of the stress, but the point-wise convergence of the stress. So, if you want the point-wise convergence of the stress, you um, want to estimate the error in this norm <coughs> and bound bound this error by a certain power of h. <clears throat> times the this regularity. But now the point is, which is the highest R <clears throat> in which this works? <clears throat> so uh, the, the, the question, in, in fact, boils down to check which is the R for which this subolet embedding is true. And, <clears throat> oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, no, that's enough. Thanks. So, <clears throat> if you want to check <clears throat> which is the R <clears throat> for, for which uh, this embedding holds, you will see that uh, R has to be smaller than S minus D minus one, which is uh, both if D, D is the space dimension, of course, two or three. So, this is more than S minus one. And S was smaller than one. S was smaller than one, though that means that the stresses cannot converge directly, point-wise. So I, I repeat, I'm not saying that you can be, you are able to prove point-wise convergence. I'm saying that you will never be able to prove point-wise convergence in this case. It's impossible because R is smaller than than uh, zero. <clears throat> a 
Of course, this reasoning applies to the irreducible form of the problem <clears throat> and also the primal mixed form <clears throat> because uh, it has the same functional setting. However, it does not apply to the dual mixed form. In the dual mixed form, we have this, uh, we have just seen that. We have this term from the Golurkin contribution plus stabilization and this term from the uh, constitutive equation plus stabilization. And here in the case of the dual form, you can directly prove that this is not R, but S. <clears throat> and S was smaller than one, but greater than zero. So in the dual form, you uh, stresses do, I mean, this is wrong, can converge. I cannot uh, prove that they converge, but I, I say that there is the possibility that they converge. And the same happens with the, <clears throat> you remember this table I showed here, the same happens with this formulation. Here you have one order less, <clears throat> one half order less, one half order less, but this is this is enough. So um, that that brings me to these uh, remarks. Well, the first one I, I have already mentioned that the stabilization allows one to mimic the dual functional setting only with the stabilization. In the case of equal displacement stress interpolation, uh, it's not S minus. Uh, it's not uh, uh, S, but at S minus one half. But since S is in fact greater than one half, uh, stresses still converge pointwise. And this is crucial. As I said, we have exploited that a lot. This is crucial in plasticity and in general in equations, in constitutive equations that are stress driven. Because what do you do in plasticity and damage? Uh, even if you, do, uh, you, you are not familiar with that, the idea is very simple. The idea is that you take the stresses at a point, point wise. Okay? With these stresses, you compute the strains. For example, in the case of plasticity, you compute the so called plastic strains. And from the plastic, and once you have the plastic strains, you go to the constitutive law and compute uh, the stresses. So, but of course, if that doesn't converge point wise, it's impossible to make it converge. It's impossible. So, um, this remark is also crucial in fracture. In fracture, a fracture is, of course, a case in which you have a re entrant corner. And of course, you cannot expect regularity more than h one half for the for the displacement and, uh, and, and, and h h to the power of r positive for the stress. You cannot expect that more than that. And if you use a standard irreducible formulation, you will never converge. Never. It's impossible. Okay. And so if you look at the literature in fracture mechanics, in damage, in, in linear solid mechanics in general, you see that what people do is they directly change the model. So they are unable to solve the, the PDE that they have to solve. So instead of that, they change the model. They say, okay, let's use a constitutive equation that is, I don't know, non-local, that involves a patch of elements. Or let's use a constitutive equation that is regularized by viscosity. Or whatever. They change the model. Where uh, our point of view is that this is intrinsically a numerical issue. Okay? So you, I, I, I don't mind. I'm not saying that the original constitutive law is perfect. I'm just saying that if this is the constitutive law and I am a numerical guy in charge of solving that equation, I have to do my best to, to solve that equation and not change the constitutive law. Okay? That's what people do. Okay. So let me go to the final uh, section. Well, not the real final one, but the displacement stress. This is very simple. Say here, so it's just the Stokes problem. Uh, if you have, um, in the case of incompressible solids, the, these are the equations you have to solve. This is the Stokes case. The problem is posed in H1 times L2, as you all know. So this is everything very standard. And the only message here is that if you use the variational multiscale approach using orthogonal the scales, the final stabilized formulation is this. So you have the Golurkin terms plus the orthogonal projection of the divergence of the stress plus the orthogonal projection of the divergence of, of this. Uh, let's say the momentum equation multiplied by. By the way, I haven't said that, but you can put here or not the orthogonal projection because the component that is not orthogonal to the finite element space will vanish when tested against it. Anyway, this is all very well known, so I will not insist on that. This is the oldest part, let's say, of the of the work. So um, with this formulation, you can prove stability and optimal convergence 
originally in this norm, and then you can move to the uh, natural norm. So H1 for velocities, L2 for, for pressures. And this is, uh, you know, just the, a classical uh, stability result expressed as an ipsum condition and the corresponding uh, convergence result. So everything works beautifully in this case. So that was John, just to um, complete the, the, the picture with the displacement pressure approach. But as I said, this is, uh, this is very, very well known. Okay, so let me just make a comment, a reflection in the, in the, in the sense of think about <clears throat> the extensions to the extension to hyperelasticity. So, okay, I recall that my point is that you can, that, that's my point. I mean, you may disagree with that, but, but um, the point is that you should never use some super stable elements because they are very restrictive. So imagine you have worked uh, with the dual form of the elasticity equation. You, you have followed the work, for instance, by Arnold, and you have seen all these fancy elements that are in super stable for the elasticity equations, and you are very happy with that. Now, how would you extend that to nonlinear hyperelasticity? Or even, or in other words, suppose that you are very happy with the three field formulation for, uh, for the, um, the elasticity, stress, displacement, and pressure. How would you extend that to nonlinear elasticity? For instance, how would you extend that to these types of problems? This is a, a problem of a paper that we have published recently. It's, uh, it's just a, a, a column submitted to torsion, and you, you, you just uh, twist it. And you let it go, and you know it, it twists this in, in both directions. So, <clears throat> do you remember the Marshall crochet element I, I introduced at the very beginning? So, do you do you think it is feasible to introduce extensions of the Marshall crochet element in these cases? So it's impossible. In the case of stabilized methods, we are able to do stability in the nonlinear case. We have published a paper with with uh, that not long ago, a year ago or so. So the comment is, would it be possible to use in superstable interpolations in this case? My point is that it is not. Some people in, <clears throat> in solid mechanics use uh, uh, variables that are very complicated. They use the deformation gradient, the H tensor, the Jacobian of the transformation. You know, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> there was a talk here a few years ago by, by a colleague of mine, Javier Bonet, who uses very complex uh, interpolations. I don't know what, what he talked about, but in that time you, you invited him, Luca. But uh, <laughs> but he, he uses he uses very a lot of strange variable steps. He uses displacements, pressure, the Jacobian of the the Jacobian of the of the of the mapping of the Lagrangian mapping. The, he uses the 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 the, the, the deformation gradient f. He uses H, the left, you know, I mean, a lot of, would it be feasible to use in super stable interpolations in this case? My point is that it is not. And another comment, for instance, <clears throat> for the displacement stress formulation. Okay, <clears throat> imagine you have uh, elements that are in super stable for this displacement, displacement K, uh, stress formulation <clears throat> in the 2D case, and you extend them to 3D. If you look at the papers by Arnold, you will see that it's not easy to extend that to three. But okay, let's assume you have done that. Now, what about shells? <clears throat> in shells, what you do is you discretize on the plane and then independently, you discretize through the thickness. <laughs> Using you know, two, three, four elements across the thickness. So this, uh, this is, for instance, uh, a calculation that we have uh, uh, done in, in, uh, in one of our last papers using the stress displacement formulation using, of course, stabilization. So the question is, would it be feasible to use in super stable elements in this context? In my opinion is that, that it is not possible, that, that directly not possible. So some conclusions, and, and before uh, listing a list of short conclusions, uh, let me just uh, draw some elements for the uh, for three of the formulations we have been talking about. So for instance, we have been talking about the Stokes case, which is the UP formulation, the primal form of the stress displacement formulation and the dual form. So what is stable for the uh, UP formulation? The simplest element that is stable, the simplest, is the so-called mini element. 
or, or uh, there's this Marini element also called, so the Marini element, in, in which you have linear displacements and enriched with a bubble function in the middle, and then linear continuous fractions. This is so called mini element. What would be a stable for the sigma u prime of four? This is easy because you take continuous displacements and then you take simply this wise constant uh, stresses, <coughs> this wise constant stresses, and this is, this is stable, trivially uh, verified. However, for the dual form, it's not so easy. For the dual form, you have to take, in the case, this is the simplest uh, uh, zero order radiatomai element, you have to take piecewise constant uh, um, displacements and uh, interpolate with the normal component of the stress tensor on the edges. So you have to change your interpolation when you change the formulation. However, using uh, stabilization, if you use the same interpolation for all variables. So in all cases, you use equal interpolation for all variables, and it's uh, much, much easier. So some concluding remarks. <clears throat> the first I think is, is from the conceptual point of view, it is, it's, it's really uh, important. So the VMS formulation allows one to decouple the discrete variational problem from the finite element interpolation. So these are two different wills. So one thing is to devise the discrete subcondition, uh, me, the discrete uh, variational equation, the discrete variational equation. And then another completely different issue is to choose the finite element interpolation. Completely different. They are unrelated. They have decoupled. Uh, well, another comment is that in the case of the three field approach, uh, the only reasonable, in my opinion, or the only reasonable strategy is to use a stabilized formulation in the case of uh, continuous stresses, because otherwise the elements are very old, ext essentially extensions of the Marshall crochet element. In the, the stress displacement approach, one can change the functional setting simply by selecting the stabilization parameters, which in my, that's something that I found very satisfying. <clears throat> uh, the last comment is that in superstable interpolation are very difficult to generalize in different cases, nonlinear problems, geometric degeneration, as, as, as in short show, combination of different operators. For instance, in the Brinkman operator, you have, you have viscosity and you have porosity. So which one dominates? If one dominates, if the viscosity dominates, you have to use elements that are insuperstable for the Stokes. But if porosity dominates, you have to use insuperstable elements that are stable for the Darcy problem. So, you know, if you have a, me a medium in which you have uh, variable uh, porosity, what are you going to use? Okay? So it's not clear. If you use stabilization, th this problem doesn't, uh, doesn't appear. And just a comment that it's that uh, among uh, the different VMS alternatives, we def definitely favor for many reasons that I haven't um, detailed here. And we definitely favor the use of uh, orthonos in this field. But in most papers, you will see classical residual methods, residual based methods that, um, that uh, also work. And that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ramon. Uh, we have time for questions, if any, also from uh, Etum, maybe, or from here. Are there two people attending? So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, many questions, but we'll confine to one, maybe two, if time allows. Uh, actually, it's not even a question. It, it, when, when you use this, uh, say, VMS, um, the uh, essentially what you are doing is to uh, um, in, introduce these double spaces, and the second space, the one of my equations, is there to basically uh, improve the accuracy in the sense that you want to. But I wouldn't say that. It's there to improve the stability. This is my this is part of my question, indeed. So uh, you um, you you had an extra space with the idea of representing the way or another the effect of the. Uh, Little frequencies, right? Right. So in this respect, you are moving toward improving accuracy. Now, now, now conclude. But then, indeed, what you see, as you, as you say, 
is that this produces extra stability. Exactly. Okay. So you have a, a risk explanation, not a mathematical explanation. Mathematical explanation is there. No, no I, I do because <clears throat> the, the problem is that at the continuous level, <clears throat> for instance, think about the Stokes plot. At the continuous level, uh, you have <coughs> um, velocities or displacements in H1 and pressures only in L2. And you have this in super stability that at the continuous level is natural. It's natural. Uh, uh, you know, between uh, H1 and, uh, and L2, this is what that is the sky approved. However, at the discrete level, this is this is not automatic, and the reason is that you are missing frequencies of of uh, displacement, frequencies of displacement that are in charge of a stabilizing action. So that's what you are missing. You are adding, um, you are adding these terms that allow you to control the pressure. <clears throat> that, that are not there in the Golurkin method, depending on the on the approximation. You use equal interpolation for displacements, and uh, displacements means the components that stabilize the pressure. And here, with this method, with this formulation, what you do is you incorporate that, that these components in a certain approximate sense. <clears throat> no, I understand this, but I mean I understand the. Uh... Me mechanistic part of the construction. On the other side, intuitively, what I would say is that uh, if you restrain your uh, approximation to just the core, the core space, say, right, uh, you have a Galerkin method and you easily prove that it's unstable. Actually, you only have a constraint to the L2 norm, as you showed, right? Uh, here, you are enlarging the, the discrete space by adding the fluctuation part and still. You are working in a Galerkin frame, so that's why I would be inclined to say that you are operating on improving the accuracy. But it, this is reflected on also a control of uh, the stability, which is a kind of miracle from my side. I mean, uh, understand it mathematically, it, yes, yes, uh, it works. But uh, no, you, you are, when you put this term, you are leaving the velocity space. You are in a greater space. Yeah. Yes. Right. And that greater space is what allows you to control the pressure. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, this is what you observe, but is this oh, well, in, uh, intuitive? It, it, the intuition is the space of of displacement is not only the displacement themselves, but also the, uh, let's say, um, differential operator applied to the test function. So since, for instance, with continuous pressure, this is not continuous anymore. So you're increasing your space. And that those components that are outside the original space is what uh, what uh, allow you to to obtain stability. Yeah, this I I mean mathematically I understand. No, another another question which is against my intuition, but sure you have an answer. Take the uh, quote quote horrible uh, crochet Marshall crochet Marshall crochet element, right? For the three field, uh, of course, horrible, uh, uh, <coughs> quote, quote, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> According to your uh, your conclusion. Well, no, I know. it's too difficult to generalize and too complex and so, and so forth. So stresses are uh, derivatives of uh, the displacement. And uh, what I said, I said. I mean, this is difficult if you want continuous stresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. Uh, so you you would expect, in principle, that uh, the, the the space for uh, stresses should be less rigid than this place of displacement, it, which is not the case. Well, it depends. Here, the space of displacement is quadratic. Exactly. And the space of stresses is linear, or by linear. Yeah, but it's iso. Yeah. Iso, Iso, yeah, yeah, yeah. Iso, U3, Iso, right? Iso. So you need more, more degrees of freedom to control it. Again, it's against my intuition, but of course, there is a mathematical explanation. This so. is the Crochet, Crochet one. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes, this is against, uh, maybe against intuition because you have to obtain control on the stress, you need a very rich uh, stress space. Yeah. And if you look at the instant condition, this is needed to stabilize the pressure, uh, excuse me, the, the displacement gradient. Yes, so to stabilize this displacement gradient, you need a very large stress space. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So this is 
you know, this result is from the 80s. This is an old result. It's from the 80s. And nothing much has been done in the developing context. If you look at, at the literature about viscoelasticity, for instance, um, everybody stabilizes the stresses, you know, this elastic viscous scale split, I don't know, whatever. You know, everybody that is working in stabilization maybe uses in superstable elements for the velocity and pressure, but they need to stabilize the stress because otherwise you are, you are, um, you are obliged to use this type of interpolation, which is very cumbersome. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Okay, if not, we thank again uh, Amon. Yeah. And there is the coffee uh, downstairs uh, at the sixth floor in front of the elevator. Okay, thanks for coming. <laughs>